Hello, welcome back. So, yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Words we all know that uh, Jesus taught as part of the Lord's Prayer. He came proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and kingdom is a central theme in the Bible. The Zondervan Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible says this about the kingdom. The word kingdom is found 55 times in Matthew, 20 times in Mark, 46 times in Luke, and five times in John. When allowance is made for the use of the word to refer to secular kingdoms and for parallel verses of the same sayings of Jesus, the phrase, the kingdom of God and equivalent expressions, for example, the kingdom of heaven or, or his kingdom, occurs about 80 times. These statistics show the great importance of the concept in the teaching uh, of, of the kingdom in the teachings of Jesus. There can therefore be little doubt that the phrase, the kingdom of God, expresses the main theme of his teaching. Now, this is such an important theme, but it has so much misunderstanding attached to it. If we must misunderstand what the kingdom is and what it means, it changes everything. It, it reveals to us this, this understanding of kingdom, reveals to us our true identity, our role here on earth, and our eternal future in heaven. So we're going to take four weeks to look at four major aspects of the kingdom of God and the impact the kingdom of God has on our lives. Before we do that, it's worth just mentioning that there are only two kingdoms. The Bible calls them the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Every person in the world is either in one or in the other. The reason I raise that is because right at the start of looking at the subject of the kingdom, we need to recognize that a lot of Christians have bought into the myth of the third kingdom. The third kingdom is a mythical kingdom, the, the kingdom of our, of our own making. The kingdom where we make the rules and we believe that because God is loving and merciful, he turns a blind eye. This kingdom may be the kingdom where, where truth is flexible, where morality is situational, where we are special and the rules that apply to other people don't apply to us and so on doesn't produce darkness like the kingdom of darkness does, and it doesn't produce great spiritual strides forward like the kingdom of God does. It just produces excuses. If the kingdom of darkness is colored black and the kingdom of God is colored white, the third kingdom, the mythical kingdom, is colored gray. The third kingdom is lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. Here's the thing, grey is in reality black, or only more so. Jesus Christ made it quite clear that he had less problem with people actually being in the kingdom of darkness than deluding themselves by believing that they inhabit some mythical lukewarm third kingdom. There are, in reality, only two kingdoms. And the focus, the purpose of the earthly ministry of Jesus was to proclaim the arrival of one of those kingdoms. The time promised by God has come at last. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. So why is understanding the kingdom of God so important? Well, the truth is our value, or sorry, our view of the kingdom of God absolutely dictates our walk as disciples of Christ and our approach to our mission here on earth. So for those who in practice live like they believe in the mythical third kingdom, for them, Christian morals are a private, flexible affair to be picked up and put down at will. Christianity becomes just a lifestyle choice, a means of enhancing your life. That's the product of living in the third kingdom, and, and that comes out of not understanding the true nature of the kingdom of God. 
Here are three truths about the kingdom of God that define our mission here on earth. Number one, despite the fact that we love our church, we love the church that we're in, the truth is the kingdom of God is not the church. Jesus Christ did not come to proclaim the church. He came to proclaim the coming of the kingdom. He announced that he would build his church, not as an end in itself, but as a means of proclaiming the kingdom. The church has always grown most healthily and been most effective when it has proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. The book of Acts is often seen as being a book that charts the growth of the church. And although that's true, it's a byproduct of a much more important theme, the proclamation of the kingdom. Right at the start of the book of Acts, Jesus appears to his disciples and we read after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about, guess what? The kingdom of God. He could have spoken about so many things, how to run a church, how to understand all the difficult passages in the Bible, how to preach a great sermon, but he chose to speak about the kingdom of God. And out of that message, the church grew. The apostles went and did likewise. They preached and talked about the kingdom. Now, this is a recurring theme all the way through the book of Acts. And right at the end of the book, Luke records that for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why is all this important? Well, because in Christianity today, we think that church growth is inextricably linked to the, the beauty of the building, the, the quality of the music, the range of activities for the children, the quality of the coffee. In the book of Acts, the church grew as the result of preaching the kingdom. What is this kingdom that they preached? Well, the Hebrew word for kingdom is malku or malkut. The malku of God is near. The word malku is not about the kingdom as an entity, but about the person who is ruling. The kingdom, therefore, is the king. The kingdom of God is near, therefore, means the king is near. He is imminent as we say. His presence, his authority, his power is right here. And Jesus came proclaiming that because he embodied that. The king is here. Jesus pointed to himself and drew people to him. Now the early church pointed to Jesus and drew people into a relationship with him. And so the church grew. You know, today the church tries to attract people not so much to Jesus as to itself. How are we going to get more people to come to church? You know, that was never a consideration for the early church. The question then was, how are we going to let people know the good news of the kingdom? The church is not the kingdom. Why do we tend to preach the church rather than the kingdom? Because we can control the church. We have traditions and methods and things we prepared earlier. The church we can control so we know what we're inviting people into. The kingdom is beyond our control. The reign of King Jesus is not something we can control. We submit to his reign. And that can be a scary thing because my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine, as he says in Isaiah 55 verse 8. We rightly love the church, but the kingdom of God is not the church. Here's the second truth about the kingdom that 
defines our mission here on earth. The kingdom is now and not yet. That is to say, Jesus' mission here on earth was to announce that the kingdom of God, the reign of God, has broken through into this world. However, the fullness of the kingdom, the Malku, the, the, the reign of the king, is not yet fully here. We see signs of what uh, that's going to be like, but they're, they're just signs, not the whole complete thing. Or as that's put in the Bible, at present we do not see everything in subjection to him. That's describing the, the not yet of the kingdom. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honour because of the suffering uh, of, of death. That's the now of the kingdom. God's kingly reign has broken through into this world in the person of Jesus Christ. He came to announce the arrival of the kingdom, but not the completion of the kingdom. That is still to come. And so now we see signs of the kingdom, promises of what is to come, but not the fullness of the kingdom. The kingdom of light is invading the kingdom of darkness, taking territory from the kingdom of darkness, and consequently is at war with the kingdom of darkness. Although the victory was won on the cross, the territory still has to be taken, that territory being human lives. The kingdom of God advances one life at a time as one life after another is reclaimed, one back from the kingdom of darkness. Now Jesus spoke about uh, this struggle when he said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it. That's a verse that gives a lot of people problems. We're supposed to be as gentle as doves. So the idea of violence seems more like what you would expect in, uh, in you know, another more militant religion. However, it's referring to the spiritual warfare that is currently going on as the kingdom of God invades enemy territory and we see terrible things being done to Christians. Um, like, you know, we were thinking about in the recent uh, International Day of Prayer where one Christian in seven in this world is currently experiencing persecution. The cost of the advancement of the kingdom is incredibly high, it's costly. And yet, the kingdom continues to grow. You can count church growth in numerical terms, but kingdom growth is different. Kingdom growth is measured in terms of spiritual attributes, morality, wholeheartedness, discipleship, and so on. Church growth will not necessarily change society, but kingdom growth certainly will. People may grow cynical about the church, but never about the kingdom, because the kingdom is where real change, real redemption, real growth happens. And that's why, as, as Jesus put it, until John the Baptist, the law of Moses, and the message of the prophets were your guides, but now the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is eager to get in. The kingdom of God is both now and not yet. We see evidence of the kingdom of God having been launched here on earth, but we also see evidence of it not being fully here yet. So we pray your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Well, perhaps the most striking feature of the kingdom is that it's all about the king and our obedience to him. In fact, the kingdom of God is about wholehearted, life-transforming obedience, not about lifestyle enhancement. Honestly, it's great to have excellent music and lighting and PA and so on, but that has more to do with church growth than kingdom growth. They're only ever vehicles to make it easier for people to hear and understand the good news of the kingdom. 
But if the church believes that it will only attract people and grow through having the best music in town or the best children's ministry or the nicest tasting coffee or the most awe-inspiring building, then it's going to attract people for whom that's important and who will only stay for as long as that is important. The number one word to describe our response to kingdom is obedience. Not satisfaction or comfort, but obedience. It is no accident that at the time that the church grew like wildfire, overturning whole nations and even conquering the mighty Roman Empire, it was the kingdom that was preached. And those who became disciples of Christ saw themselves as being his slaves. Slaves of the king. You look at three examples. Jesus' brother James, for example. He writes, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then there's Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. He wrote, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. Or Jude, another of Jesus' brothers who wrote, this letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ. The presence of the kingdom of God can be detected by disciples of Christ seeking to serve him sacrificially and wholeheartedly, not demanding that they are noticed or honoured, but happy to see themselves as a slave of Jesus Christ, honoured to serve him. The irony is that, particularly in the Western church, Christians often try to lower the bar in terms of commitment, thinking that the lower the commitment expectation, the more willing people will be to become Christians. And the church in the West goes on shrinking. But the church that turned the world upside down, that saw the gospel spread to the ends of the earth, that saw people coming to Christ in their thousands and their hundreds of thousands, preached the good news of the kingdom, demanding that people deny themselves, take up their cross and follow Jesus Christ, that they live lives of obedience, of full devotion. They preached the kingdom they lived the kingdom. They recognised no third kingdom. And the church grew like wildfire. Lives were changed. Miracles happened. Society was not only impacted, it was transformed. They preached, the king is among us. And that changes everything. So, Lord Jesus, we welcome you as the king, the Malkut, who came proclaiming your kingdom come. You introduced the kingdom of God into our midst, into this world, and you call on us to acknowledge you as King and Lord and to serve you, to bow down before you. And Father, we have somehow translated all of that into, I have come to provide you with a comfortable experience. I've come to provide you with comfortable chairs, with comfortable coffee, with comfortable surroundings with a comfortable message. But you came proclaiming the kingdom of God. And that is what impacted the world. And I pray, Lord Jesus, once more, you would turn our hearts away from comfort and towards kingdom. The kingdom of God is near because the king is here. And Lord, I pray that we would turn from comfort, turn towards you, King Jesus, and say, yes, Lord, count me in. I'm here as your slave to serve you, to bow down before you, to live in your kingdom as a citizen of the kingdom of God. 
Lord, would you open our eyes and teach us at this time about your kingdom come? Would you just refocus us away from our comfort and towards your kingdom? Because this world needs the transforming, powerful message that the kingdom of God is near. And so we pray, Lord, yes, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray it and long for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope you can stay with us as we go through the next, uh, well, three weeks now, uh, this four-part uh, series on Yours is the Kingdom, as we get a fresh understanding, but a fresh um, uh, excitement about and commitment to the kingdom of God. You, Jesus came proclaiming that the kingdom of God is near and I pray that all of us would be um, freshly enthused with the desire to proclaim the same message. The kingdom of God is, is near because the king is among us. So join us again next time for the second in this uh, four-part series on Yours is the Kingdom. See you then.